Our last speaker before the break is Laura Prins. She is an art historian, a PhD researcher, and lecturer at Amsterdam uh, UMC, VU MC, <laughs> um, where she's writing a history on the relationship between creativity and mental illness. In 2015-2016, uh, she was a researcher on the project On the Verge of Insanity, Van Gogh's Van Gogh and His Illness, uh, which culminated in the exhibition and the publication, uh, and a symposium also that we held uh, at uh, uh, organized by the Van Gogh Museum. Um, Laura has contributed to several publications on Van Gogh and modern art, including Dans les yeux de Van Gogh au, at Musée Rops in 2021, Rethinking Kirchner at Kirchner Museum Davos and Art Center Basel, and Van Gogh into the Undergrowth at the Cincinnati Art Museum. Laura, please take the floor. Thank you, Nienke, and thank you all for coming. Um, is it necessary for an artist to suffer in order to create great art, maybe even inevitable? This question was frequently asked during the 19th century. It is based on the age-old um, idea that genius and madness often coincided, known today as the relationship between creativity and mental illness. And it's still studied today by uh, psychologists and psychiatrists. In my PhD research, I studied the history of this relationship. Today I will focus on the 19th century, on what this concept meant, and how Van Gogh perceived it. In July 1890, Van Gogh ended his life by his own choice. He was only 37. Suicide is of all time, of course, but in the 19th century, it became a popular topic. For one, because of the many famous examples one could mention. One particular category were the creative geniuses. Delacroix, for instance, wrote in his unpublished autobiographical manuscript somewhere in the 1850s. The history of our times presents sad examples of the unhappy lives of artists. One of these sad examples, he mentioned, was the artist Gros, a famous contemporary of Delacroix, whose body was found in a river in 1835. It was said he drowned himself after his success had died out. Here we see the moment Go walked into the river by a Dutch artist. Receiving criticism, being misunderstood, and lacking appreciation, these were pressing elements for artists trying to make a living, even those who already knew success, such as Go. Artists with high ambitions were also aware that their work would outlive them and were conscious of leaving a legacy. Delacroix certainly was. It was exactly this suffering, martyr-like image that had become a caricature early in the 19th century. Like in the satire of Ignato, in which the poor poet, a bit pathetically, threatens to fall from a not too high rock into his knife and left his work behind in front of a laurel on the cross, believing a sacrifice will lead to fame. It was also this image that was popular in novels, such as by Balzac, Concours, and Zola. Usually the painters were portrayed as the dramatic, unstable, and irrational characters, ending up in even more dramatic deaths. In 1882, Van Gogh had already written, it appears that writers are always unfortunate with painter characters. Balzac among them. His painters are fairly uninteresting. In 1882, Van Gogh could not have imagined that he would be the model of I don't know how many suffering artist characters in novels. Already in 1892, Mirbeau loosely based his character Lucien on Van Gogh in his novel Dans le Ciel. Lucien painted according to his personality, which was aggressive, emotional, and intense. In the end, he literally died for his art. Van Gogh would not have reacted much more favorably to such narratives either. It was an echo of how he was depicted by Laurier in his article Les Isolés, a portrayal Van Gogh felt uncomfortable with. It, both him and his work were presented as nervous, intense, feverish, and never to be entirely understood. There was a tendency to relate the style of an artist with his personality. But once critics were able to read Van Gogh's letters, they also found out how rational he discussed his own work. For instance, in 1893, the Wieseva considered Van Gogh's art as absolutely insane, but also the product of an intelligent and lucid man, similar to Delacroix, after the Wieseva had read his journal. In the same way, Eugène Delacroix left us the work of a sick man, and he was the healthiest of men, by which I mean in terms of strength and clarity of mind. 
Even so, in his letter of AD 82, Van Gogh did not deny that this Claude Lentier's uh, existed, referring to Zola's L'Oeuvre. In fact, Van Gogh considered the creative occupation to be very risky. But what did that mean in the 19th century? It is an age-old commonplace, the idea that genius and madness often coincided. It was already a cliché in ancient times, actually. Madness did not necessarily mean mental illness. It could refer to a spiritual gift, such as Socrates in his demon. And for the symbolist, madness was the idea of having a pure, original and innocent mind. But there has always been a certain risk attached to it. Geniuses were considered to be prone to obsessions, eccentricity, and overstraining their brains. In the 19th century, this idea became corrupted, so to speak, when medical doctors sought for explanations for what made a genius different. Not that doctors wanted to pathologize a genius for the sake of pathologizing, but by studying the lives of geniuses, they believed that they could find answers on what mental illness is and how it could be treated. How genius was perceived naturally followed from the state of medicine at that time. It was the early days of psychiatry, avant la lettre, to be clear. In the late 18th century, or sorry, in the, yeah, in the late 18th and the early 19th century, mental illness was usually defined as a false perception caused by uncontrolled emotions and an overactive imagination. Hallucination was a newly adopted medical term. Psychiatrists also noticed different degrees of in illness. You could have certain mental problems, such as hallucinations, but still function normally. In this context, Dr. Lelu studied, studied Socrates and his demon, and his inner voice who advised him what not to do. Since he was the only one hearing this voice, Socrates must have had hallucinations, according to Lelu, and he considered them to be a symptom of mental illness. But because of his healthy constitution, Socrates was able to maintain his obsessive intellectual faculties. Not every medical doctor agreed with this reading. Some had even downright devastating criticism. But it led to lively discussions on what a hallucination exactly is, if it was a symptom of mental illness at all, and where the line should be drawn between hallucination and a vivid imagination. As it happened, the Lacroix depicted in the same period Socrates and his demon in the decoration of Palais Bourbon stressing that the demon symbolized inspiration for the true genius. During the 19th century, it became more common to perceive mental illness as a physical condition. It was caused by a sensitive nervous system related to heredity, degeneration, and partly lifestyle. The prospects were now less optimistic. Dr. Moreau de Tour presented the hereditary nervous system as a tree whose branches could lead to all kinds of illnesses. In one family, you could find idiocy, neurosis, epilepsy, but also exceptional minds, such as in the science, as we see above here, the arts, music, and painting, and criminals also. Moreau used biographical facts of historical eminent men to illustrate his thesis. Lombroso took Moreau's theory even further in his famous Genius and Madness, which knew many editions and translations. Even though his theories were often dismissed as scientific gossip, they were repeated nonetheless. So, despite the lack of medical consensus, the commonplace itself was rarely denied, and these ideas of an overactive imagination, obsessive and uh, eccentric character, and sensitive nerves remained attached to genius, especially the creative ones. Symbolists were aware of the theories and careful not to relate their artistic ideas of madness to real mental illness. But what did Van Gogh know? Although Van Gogh was interested in health and liked to consult medical manuals and doctors, there is no sign that he read about these specific medical theories on genius and madness. He did refer to these medical commonplaces quite frequently. He believed artists were prone to illness because of their sensitive nervous system and their lifestyle. He referred to these fatalistic ideas of uh, degeneration. There was simply nothing you could do, he thought. He felt his body was a burden. Van Gogh also blamed society. The new painters, alone, poor, treated like madmen, and as a result of this treatment, becoming so in fact, at least as far as their social life is concerned. In other words, the artist was driven to the edge of society by society. Van Gogh believed he was one of them. 
so in the same letter, the, same, uh, the more I become dissipated, ill, a broken pitcher, the more I too become a creative artist in that great revival of art of which we're speaking. In a way, he believed that illness was a necessary sacrifice. After becoming seriously ill, Van Gogh believed his condition to be an illness of the South. This was another common idea, also discussed by Lombroso, who claimed that hot climates increased the numbers in both geniuses and madness. In addition to his sensitive nerves, Van Gogh considered the imagination a risk as well. Parallel to the medical discussions on hallucinations, artists discussed what imagination is and how it should be used. Imagination usually still meant working from nature, but the real artist had a certain sensitivity in how he observed the world around him, had the freedom to invent, and was able to make visible what others could not see. Delacroix argued, for instance, that every person had the faculties of perception and memory, but only few had imagination, and these were the geniuses. This rare faculty was a blessing and a curse, because Delacroix felt the constant pressure to create and use his inspiration. As a young artist, he referred to it as a sleeping lion, who was afraid to wake up, because his roaring could be felt in every inch of his body, and he considered his lion to be similar to the demon of Socrates. Imagination was also a well-debated topic between Van Gogh and his contemporaries, especially with Gauguin, of course. Van Gogh wished to balance working from his imagination and from nature. He was worried to exhaust his mind. After his illness worsened, he preferred to avoid too much abstractions and too much exaggerations. In Auvergne, he mentioned a few times that his work actually aggravated his illness. In an unfinished, unfinished response to Gauguin, who had written appreciatively to Van Gogh's Arlichen after a drawing by Gauguin, Van Gogh said that the synthesis of an Arlichen should be taken as a work by you and me, like a summary of our months of work together. To do it, I, for my part, paid with another month of illness. But I also know that this is a canvas that will be understood by you, me, and just one or two others, as we'd like it to be understood. It's reminding of Aurier's comment that Van Gogh's art would never be fully understood. One month later, he wrote in an unfinished letter to his brother, Ah, oh, well, I risk my life for my own work, and my reason has all foundered in it very well. In the rest of this letter, Van Gogh talked about the problematic relation between art dealers and artists, Theo, of course, being the exception. Working hard as an artist, believing that only a few would understand it, and sacrificing your life for it. It does sound like the stereotypical image of the unhappy and uninteresting painters in novels, Van Gogh quite despite. But Van Gogh was no caricature. In the letter he did send to Theo, and it happened to be his last as far as we know, uh, as for myself, I'm applying myself to my canvases with all my attention. I'm trying to do as well as certain painters whom I've liked and admired a great deal. Looking at the lives of other artists was a way for Van Gogh to cope with the pressures of being an artist. Again, he was no exception. Delacroix did exactly the same, calling this his wish to identify his soul with someone else. There are multiple times that Van Gogh referred to others. When he was exhausted after a day painting in the wheat fields of Arles in the mid of summer, he said he often thought of, and I quote, that excellent painter Monticelli, who people said was such a drinker and insane. End quote. Monticelli was nonetheless capable of balancing his colors on the canvas, as was Van Gogh himself. He looked at Delacroix with his weak constitution, who had, quote, certainly overtaxed his brain. End quote. But Delacroix was richer, therefore in the position to take better care of himself. When Van Gogh complained to Bernard that his body sometimes felt as a burden, he added resignedly that this was, again a quote, already since Giotto, this sickly character, and that's the way things are. In October 1888, just before Gauguin's arrival, Van Gogh informed Theo that he had worked really hard without proper food, and that he was, once again, nearly reduced to the state of madness of Hugo van der Goes in Emil Wouter's painting. The Flemish painter was seized with some strange madness and given music therapy in the cloisters. Almost, Van Gogh said, because, as he continued in his letter, if it wasn't for the fact that I had something of a dual nature, something of both the monk and the painter, I should be, and that long since, utterly and entirely reduced to the above-mentioned state. Van Gogh was always looking for the antidote for his artistic madness, as he called it, always searching for balance, even after he fell seriously ill and had to cope with his new reality. 
as we have seen, the relationship between creativity and mental illness felt very real to Van Gogh. But his references were nuanced, ambiguous, and changed over time. He based them on age-old commonplaces, in line with medical views of the time, but most of all they were formed by his own experience and the stories of like-minded artists. Although he believed at first that suffering was both inevitable and maybe even necessary for his art, in the end he was not so sure anymore. He had experienced firsthand how devastating illness was, and in the end his life was attacked by the very root, as he said. We can only speculate about his reasons, of course, but clearly there was no antidote left. It is comforting to think of the closing words of Sylvester in his chapter of Delacroix. These words Van Gogh loved so much, and he repeated it several times. Thus died, almost smiling, Eugène Delacroix, a painter of high breeding who had a sun in his head and a thunderstorm in his heart, who, from warriors went to saints, from saints to lovers, from lovers to tigers, and from tigers to flowers. Thank you. <laughs>